and um, right, cool. Um, so that recording will be available later, so people can um, uh, you can share this with other people uh, if you're so inclined. Uh, so I've just screen shared. Hopefully you can all see my uh, slide deck. Uh, this is just going to help me uh, talk through. Um, uh, through this evening. Um, there's also going to be an opportunity for questions. Um, so feel free to write questions in the comments section. Uh, down the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a there's ability to chat. Uh, throw those comments uh, in the comment section. Gary um, will keep a close eye on those, uh, hopefully group together similar questions, uh, and there will be some time for me to answer those at the end, or other people might have some. Uh, answers it. So feel free to answer other people's questions uh, if you're experienced in the area as well um, and have that conversation in the chat. I won't be following it because I get distracted. So um, let me kick off. So the Overland Track, uh, as I mentioned, is on Palawa country uh, in Tassie. It sits uh, um, sort of in that north uh, western corner of Tasmania. It officially starts at uh, Cradle Mountain at the Visitor Centre. Um, and uh, it actually starts with a short bus trip uh, to, uh, to the point where you start walking and then um, heads, depending on which way you do it, for about 60 or 80 kilometres uh, through to Cynthia Bay. Um, it's most popular uh, over, most people walk it over summer, over the warmer months. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and you can see on the right hand side, I've just sort of broken the walk into the chunks um, between the major campsites. And, and it's kind of how most people walk and uh, just spending a day on each of these. So for most people who are uh, bushwalkers and moderately fit, uh, you can see that most of the days are actually uh, relatively short. Um, on the core section of the overland track. Um, so the first day is one of the bigger days and harder days. You've got some uh, steep hills. You've got a 300 vertical metre climb, and we'll go through this in a little bit more detail soon. Um, and then um, day three, if you're just doing each of these sections one day at a time, uh, Windermere to Peeling is one of the longest days uh, on, on track in terms of uh, just raw distance. Um, and... Um, uh, and there's some big hills in there. But again, uh, for most people, if you're used to walking with a pack, which I'd highly recommend is you have some practice before you hit the overland track, uh, it's very achievable. Um, and on some of these bigger days, you might just want to start off earlier, especially if the weather's uh, looking wet. Um, and the last section here from Narcissus to Cynthia Bay um, can easily actually be broken into two, two halves as well, as there's a... Um, there's a hut called Echo Point in the campsite about halfway along the bay. Um, but we'll get to that again very shortly. So I thought I'd start off, it's always risky playing a video uh, on one of these webinars, but I'm going to play a video. Um, and this is a, um, a flyover of the whole walk. So I'm just going to um, try to give you a sense of uh, the walk as a whole. And then I'm going to talk a little bit, bit more about um, the campsites and the preparation. So as we know, uh, the Overland Track it sits down in Tassie. Um, it's this section of it that I'm showing is about 80 kilometers long. It's the full length that starts at formerly at Ronnie Creek. Um, Ronnie Creek, you can get a bus there uh, and you go up this beautiful valley, bun grass plains, uh, and you sort of hit your first climb uh, up on top uh, to our first crater lake, it's called, uh, the sheer cliffs. Uh, the views across Marion's lookout, I'll uh, see if I can pause this, okay, um, uh, are quite spectacular. Um, and then you come to uh, the first uh, real side trip uh, option. So uh, in the middle of our um, screen here is uh, Kitchen Hut, uh, which is a day use area. Uh, great place um, if, you, if you're here well before lunch and the weather's uh, uh, going to allow it. Great place to uh, leave your packs and then head to the top of Cradle Mountain. Um, and then we continue along uh, what's called Cradle Circuit, sort of at the bottom of uh, Cradle Mountain. On the right hand side, you can see Barn Bluff, which is a fantastic side trip, but it's quite challenging. Um, so I wouldn't recommend it for everyone. Um, the, the last part of it is very steep and, um, you know, using both hands and your feet to get to the top. Um, and then you come down this ridge to Waterfall Valley. Uh, the photos I've got here of an old hut. Uh, there's a new hut that was put in last year. Uh, the next day we sort of cruise, day two is sort of this nice, fairly lazy day. 
uh, going across some open uh, grassy plains, again, um, button grass plains. Um, and then as you come over to the rise, you come to some of your first few lakes and there's a side trip off there to Lake Will, uh, which is really nice There's a sandy beach. The water's always cold, obviously, um, but it's always a bit of fun. And then you come down to Lake Windermere. After a fairly uh, lovely day of walking, it's a great place to uh, set your tent up or set your camp up, wander back down to the uh, lake, have a bit of a swim, um, and have your hot chocolates ready uh, for after you get out of the water because it is a bit chilly. This next day is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the longest days, um, but it is one of the most spectacular in my view. You're walking across this really long bud and grass plain. You've got a uh, little um, little water holes along the way. You've got some lookouts down to the Fourth Valley, which is this big valley on our left. You can see some of the big mountains off to our uh, to our front uh, to head. Uh, there, Mount Ossa being the highest peak in Tassie. We've got Peely in the west to our right there. Um, and then you go through this lovely dense forest um, as the track winds down uh, to a, a place called Frog Flats, uh, which is a, a campsite. Um, but most people don't camp here, but um, have a sort of a later lunch uh, down here. There's a lovely little creek uh, flowing through the middle. Um, and then you wander up through the forest and you come up onto the, the Pelion Plain, uh, which has quite a history, not only with Aboriginal people, but also uh, mining and um, uh, some of the cattle and trappers uh, through there. So there's some great old huts there as well. Then Pelion Hut's one of the biggest huts. There's a big uh, mountain behind us that's also worth climbing. I'll talk about side trips in a little while. Um, and then we head up through the Pelion Valley up to Pelion Gap. Two great side trips. On the right-hand side is Mount Ossa, the highest peak in Tassie, um, which is probably one of the most popular side trips. On the left is Mount Pelion East, um, which is quite a spectacular climb. I've been up there for sunrise a few times, um, but, but it is, again, it's probably more challenging than uh, Mount Ossa itself, although probably a bit uh, less time because you're not walking as far. Um, and then uh, we're coming down to Kiora, uh, which is a lovely campsite with a uh, hut and a new hut going in soon as well, uh, and this beautiful creek and waterfall. Uh, this next day is I, I just call waterfall day. So you, you start with the waterfall at Kiora, uh, you go past the Duquesne hut, which is a great place for morning tea, uh, day use hut, and then you go past the Ferguson, Ferguson's and a few other uh, spectacular waterfalls here. Get going early on this day so that you can visit all the waterfalls and have lunch at one of them. Um, it's just fantastic. Um, and then after leaving the waterfalls, you head up through uh, the Duquesne Gap, a uh, bit of a climb up the hill, uh, and then you come down the other side uh, to a spot called Windy Ridge, um, where there uh, is a quite a ridiculously oversized hut, in my opinion, um, there. Um, but uh, again, a pretty welcome uh, spot to stay either in the hut or in the tent. And then we cruise along the valley. This is where the walking becomes much easier, your pack's much lighter, uh, and the terrain is um, much flatter. Um, much more dense, tall forest, um, you're getting into some of the more eucalypt forest here rather than the big alpine plains that were on earlier. Um, and about halfway to the lake, you've got a track off to the right here up to Pine Valley. I won't really talk a lot about it, um, but if you can spend more time on the overland track, Pine Valley is just magic and it gives you access to other areas like uh, the labyrinth um, uh, and is, is very worth, well worth spending a couple of days up there if you can. So a lot of people finish the walk here uh, at the uh, tip of the lake and you can get a ferry across. Um, I would highly recommend if you can have the time to spend the extra day or two uh, to wander the lake. I've done the walk, uh, I actually lost track, I can't remember whether it's six or seven times, but um, I've only once caught the ferry um, and, and ever since the first time when I caught the ferry, I've walked the lake. Um, and I usually actually walk the lake over two days because halfway just here where we're going past now is a, is a great hut. It's called Echo Point. It's, it's the oldest, most rundown hut, but it's right on the water. And there's this fantastic wharf. There's a sandy beach um, and there's a beautiful campsite to pitch your tent in if you don't want to camp in the hut. Um, and um, it, you, you sort of get there for lunch. You have a lazy day. You swim. Um, and it's a really nice way to finish it. And then on the last day, you, you pack up uh, a brekkie and then you just enjoy this last stretch along the lake before you come into 
all the people that smell like perfume and deodorant and all those things that you haven't smelt for a week um, and enjoy yourself a big burger uh, when you come into Cynthia Bay. Um, and, and that's sort of where the walk uh, wraps up uh, formally. So it's 80 k's if you include uh, the lake. It's about 65 if you uh, catch the ferry. Uh, there is a fee for the ferry. You do need to book it because it does actually um, book out. But hopefully that gives you uh, is a helpful overview. I hope that the video uh, worked. I shouldn't have stopped sharing. I should have gone to the next slide. Let me go back into the slide deck. Here we go. Ah, don't start that again. Next slide. Come on. There we go. Great. So um, I thought uh, for the rest of the talk, I, I just want to talk through some of the different aspects of the walk. Um, and, um, uh, and, and we'll talk a bit about preparation. And, and I'll send you off to some of the links uh, for some of um, uh, where you can get the maps and more details on, on, on what you need to know, because we certainly can't cover everything. Uh, in, in this webinar, but hopefully it's a teaser um, and, and get you thinking. So I use the term hut, cabins here, huts, whatever you want to call them. Um, the, the overlay attracts quite well renowned for it. Uh, it makes a lot of sense in the context of Tassie to have huts. Um, we don't have these sort of walks in New South Wales. It doesn't, um, we can have that conversation another time. Uh, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense in New South Wales to have this style of walking. Uh, we've got better options here, but, but in Tassie and in New Zealand, it makes sense. Um, and these huts, uh, some of them have a great history from, uh, from trappers and from early explorers uh, using the area. Um, and some of them are more modern uh, and uh, some of them are for day use only. So the kitchen hut is in the day walk area. Uh, it's a great place for lunch. A great place to store your pack if you're climbing some of the uh, mountains on uh, around the area. Uh, but uh, it's otherwise, if you're going to stay there overnight, it's only for emergency use. Um, Scott Kilvert's a little bit off to the side of uh, the overland, but it's a um, it's a good option if you want to just stretch things out and you want to spend a bit more time uh, exploring uh, the cradle. Um, Cradle Mountain in that area. So you can duck off there. Waterfall Valley Hut, again, this hut's just been replaced in the last two days, last, sorry, last two years. Um, I haven't been there since the new hut opened, actually it was only a year ago. Um, uh, quite a beautiful looking hut, really, uh, really looks quite impressive, um, uh, but sits at the same site as this one. Windermere Hut, uh, some of these again are going to be replaced. Uh, but these just give you a sense of the different styles of hut. Burt Nichols is that one at Windy Ridge uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it is enormous. It's like walking into a school camp. Um, but most of the huts sleep about 20 people. Um, um, and uh, all of them have tent platforms near, uh, nearby. So the inside of the huts, uh, the main photo here is the new Pelion hut. Um, it has a beautiful deck uh, out the front, which is on the right-hand side of this photo, looking across the Pelion Plain, um, and um, is, is one of my favourite places. Whenever I walk the overland, um, I always spend two nights here. Um, you, you're allowed to, once you start, you have to start on a particular day when you book, uh, but you can walk at whatever pace you want. And I'd highly recommend spending a couple of days uh, at Pelion um, because there's just so much to see there. And it's a good chance just to regroup and to, um, you know, to do some day walks with a lighter pack. Uh, some of these other photos just give you a sense of the facilities inside. That they are basic, um, but um, but they're they're weather tight. So the huts have um, uh, sleeping platforms. They're just timber platforms. You need to bring your own mattress uh, and your own sleeping equipment, um, and they're shared. Um, so you're sleeping with other people. Uh, some are stinky. Some are snoring. Um, and some of those might be me as well. Um, and some of the smaller huts you can see on the top right hand side, Kiora, uh, uh, which is about to be replaced. But um, you can see it get quite crowded, particularly after a wet day with everybody hanging their clothes up to, to dry. But it's a beautiful social experience. So I had a fantastic night in Kiora. In fact, the night this photo was taken, I walked it with my wife and my uh, two kids. That's Laura yawning uh, there with her big jacket on. Um, she was. Uh, eight, I think, at the time when we walked it. Um, the kids were uh, reasonably experienced walkers, so they carried all their own gear. Um, they had full packs on. Um, uh, and we ran into another family at the hut this night. Um, in fact, there were two families. Um, uh, they were cousins. Um, uh, and so there were, I don't know, there were probably 10 kids, something like that. We were sitting around the table. 
um, playing card games, spoons, and a few other sort of loud games, um, uh, passing popcorn around, cooking, cooking fresh popcorn and hot chocolates and all this sort of stuff and eating and um, just having a fantastic night. Um, and everybody in the hut was joining in. Um, but the side of that is huts can get a bit uh, noisy. Uh, now, we were conscious um, that um, everybody who was there was quite keen to join in that night. Uh, but sometimes you do get uh, noisy groups in huts. So sleeping in tents is, uh, is actually uh, a really good option. Uh, and there's fantastic camping uh, along, the whole, the, along the whole walk. Um, so every hut other than Echo Point have um, tent platforms. They're um, um, timber platforms and they have chains and little um, clips uh, that you can clip your tent down with. Uh, they work really well. Um, and it means um, that we're protecting the environment. So the grass is growing right up to the tent platforms. You're not getting these uh, highly trodden areas, uh, highly compacted soil uh, that does all the damage. You're getting these um, um, tent platforms uh, and often, um, like at Windermere here on the right-hand side and Kiora to some degree as well, um, the tent platforms are put off in these sort of radius. So you've got the, these little um, tracks leading off to a tent platform. So you can get much quieter and private areas um, to, to spend the night. Um, they all have little um, metal platforms, metal, metal plates on them as well, where you can cook from. Um, and so if you're walking it, seriously think about um, at least spending some of the nights in tents. Now, you have to carry a tent when you walk the overland. You can't book the huts, the public huts. Uh, it's first come, first serve basis. Um, and so, so you, you need to be carrying your tent anyway. Um, and it's just a different experience. I would encourage you to try both. Um, um, camping in the tents is a much more generally a much more peaceful experience, uh, a lot more solitude, a lot more time for reflection, and um, you get to see more wildlife. Once you're in a hut, I talk about getting sucked into the vortex of a hut, um, you, you end up staying in the hut. You don't get out, you don't explore as much, you don't see as much as the wildlife. You tend, um, it's easy to miss the sunset and all that sort of stuff, um, but then it's a much more social experience. So depending on why you're walking, if you're wanting to meet a lot of walkers uh, and meet other people, the huts are a great way to do that. Uh, but if you are staying in the huts, um, I would strongly encourage you to get out each, um, spend as much time as you can out of the hut, uh, particularly if the weather is clear. Um, you can see from this photo in the background, um, you know, some of the views are just fantastic. Uh, and most of the huts have um, uh, a helicopter platform, um, which is just looks like a big tent platform, really, with a big H in the middle. Um, and uh, that's actually often my favourite place uh, where I'll have dinner. Um, so... Uh, if a helicopter comes, you can get out of the way nice, quick and easy. So there's no problem there. Um, but they're, they're in a big open clearing. Um, and so I'd usually head out there with a couple of other people that I've met on the track, um, uh, either cook dinner there or cook dinner in the hut and eat it out there um, and just watch the sunset and spend some time sharing stories uh, and the like. Um, so the huts are great, but camping is great too, is my short summary there. Um, look, I Toilets and water tanks, it's worth talking about. We won't dwell on them, um, but um, but all the campsites and huts do have um, drop toilets, um, so pit toilets. Um, they vary in stink factor quite significantly, um, uh, but they are very, um, uh, they're very handy, uh, particularly people who are as experienced walkers or um, who just don't like to dig a hole and squat. Um, so they're there. Um, and are very reliable. Um, also, all the huts have water tanks. Um, they encourage you to treat the water um, before drinking it. Uh, personally, I don't, um, and I've never had a problem, um, um, but um, take some sort of water treatment system anyway with you um, and use it. I used a UV steriliser. Uh, for the trip, um, the uh, water filters, the inline water filters are really quite popular on track. Um, some people use the, the chlorine tablets, um, uh, but, but I would strongly suggest if you get uh, treating the, the tank water, use the UV or the, the filter type um, because the water just tastes beautiful. And if you're adding chemicals, um, you lose a bit of that. Um, we use a lot of that. <laughs> um, now, the other thing with walking in Tassie is that there's creeks quite, um, there's a lot of creeks 
uh, everywhere. Um, so you don't need to carry a lot of water in your pack. In fact, most times I'm only carrying about a litre uh, just for convenience. Um, and um, I'll fill up during the day, treat the water from the creeks and uh, fill up as I go. Um, so they're beautiful. Now, the overland track, we'll talk a little bit about how long to spend on, on track soon. Um, but for me, the overland track is, it's all about the side trips. The track itself is spectacular. Uh, and if all you walk is the core route from the beginning to the end, you'll have a fantastic time and you'll love it um, and you'll see some amazing stuff. Um, but if you can uh, explore some of the side trips, um, they are, um, they're just well worth it. They, they're just amazing. So the first, so I'll just quickly run through these. I won't go into them in detail, but Cradle Mountain, <coughs> it's probably one of the more popular ones. It's on day one. Um, it is, I guess probably, my guess, I, there's no stats on this, but my guess is about half the people walking the overland do uh, walk Cradle Mountain at the same time. Um, so there's no pressure to do it. It's not as like everyone's doing it. And it really depends on the weather. All these side trips, um, you really do need um, clear, sunny weather, um, wet weather, uh, icy conditions. Uh, it, they, they become very dangerous. Um, but Cradle Mountain, we all know what Cradle Mountain looks like. Um, uh, it, it's worth doing. It takes a while. Um, so if you're going to do Cradle Mountain, you definitely do need an early start uh, on that day one. Um, so pick up your tickets the day before. Um, I would suggest if you're wanting to do Cradle and Barnes Bluff, that you pick up your passes the day before from parks uh, and stay um, at the start of the walk uh, for the night so that you can kick off um, early. Um, and um, and just just pace yourself and just take it take take your time enjoying it. So Cradle Mountain is fantastic. Barn Bluff is is not a particularly popular side trip, uh, but everybody looks at it and wishes they climbed it. Um, it's that really steep one that I pointed out at the start. Um, it, it's certainly worth wandering along the track for a little while. There's beautiful views down into um, Waterfall Valley itself. The last few hundred metres of Barn Bluff is a particularly hairy climb um, and it's not particularly clear which way you go. So uh, I would recommend trying it solo um, and, um, and pace yourself. Uh, Innes Falls uh, is, oh, sorry, that's um, Lake Wills. Uh, Lake Will um, is um, worth, worth uh, very much worth a side trip. Uh, it's on a short day. Um, head out there, have lunch uh, on one of the beaches. And if you want to go out to the falls at the end of the lake, uh, that, that's good. Uh, the Mercy River is not so much of a side trip. The, the, there's a, the lookout to the Mercy, the, the Fourth Valley um, lookout, which is really short and it's a great morning tea spot. Um, and then you also kick down across it. Uh, the old Pelion Hut, which is just before you get to the Pelion Hut itself, is well worth a visit. Um, usually pretty tired by the end of that day. So if you're spending two days at Peely and Hart, um, backtrack day two, um, go and check out the old hut. Uh, you can actually go and see the old mine. Uh, and there's actually a really good swimming spot just behind the old hut as well. Um, and Mount Oakley is also a cracker of a trip um, for uh, if you're having that rest day at Peely. And Mount Oakley is, is the view that we're looking at here. So the view, this photo was taken from Peely and Hut, the new Peely and Hut. Um, and uh, that is um, Mount Oakley in the background. Uh, there's a couple of short waterfalls um, on the next day as you're heading up towards Pelion Gap, which is well worth the trip. Um, just dump your pack, run down, have a look. It's only a few minutes. Uh, Mount Ossa. Uh, so the, the trek heads up to Pelion Gap, um, and the right-hand side uh, takes you up to Mount Ossa. There's a mountain partway up called Mount Doris, I believe, uh, which also gives you views. Um, Mount Ossa is deceptively uh, a long walk. I think you need about four hours return. Um, the, uh, once you feel like you're at the top of Mount Ossa, you've still got a fair way to go. You sort of do this big climb and then Mount Ossa is sort of this long, um, sort of flattish top mountain to it. So it takes you a while to still get to the very end, um, to the very peak of Ossa. But, but it's well worth doing and it is uh, quite spectacular. Uh, and quite popular. It's probably one of the more popular side trips other than these next few waterfalls. Um, Mount Pelion East is the uh, left-hand side um, from Pelion Gap. 
Um, and it's more of a, it's a real defined peak. Uh, you, when you get to the top of Pelion East, you, um, you're climbing, you're using both hands um, and um, you feel um, it's quite precarious sitting, sitting on top, um, but you, you're looking down to the views all the way around you. It's a full 360 degree panoramic view. It's, it's a way more spectacular view than Mount Ossa itself. So climb Mount Ossa if you want to say you've been to the top of uh, Tassie. Uh, if you want a genuinely better view and you're happy with um, rock scrambling, uh, Pearly and East, in my view, is, <coughs> is a better climb if you have to choose one or the other, which you probably will. You probably won't get both in. Uh, then you've got these series of falls uh, the next day. Uh, D'Alton, uh, Ferguson and Harnett Falls. Uh, they're all good. They're all very different. D'Alton's probably my favourite. Um, and, um, but, um, you know, it's hard to choose. Uh, they're, they're all good. Um, and certainly worth taking um, your lunch down uh, and enjoying them. Uh, I mentioned the side trip up to Pine Valley. It's, um, if you can spend a few extra days on track, and we'll talk about itineraries in a little while, uh, but Pine Valley Hut, um, it sits at the end of this uh, side trip. And from there, uh, you can get up into the labyrinth and um, spend another day up there exploring the area, come back, stay at the um, uh, Pine Valley Hut, and then wander down again, campsite there as well. Um, not many people doing the overland end up going to Pine Valley, so don't feel like you can't. Um, but, but if you can spend about 10 days on track, um, then um, Pine Valley really fits in nicely uh, as part of that. Uh, Echo Point Hut and, and uh, Fergie's Paddock campsites. I, I've listed as a side trip here because most people think of the overland track as finishing at the lake and they catch the ferry back. Um, but really, to me, they're, they're, um, they're very much worth doing, worth, worth getting in there and exploring. Uh, I mentioned earlier food uh, that we were sitting around cooking popcorn uh, and uh, I take food quite seriously. Um, uh, you can see that by the size of my stomach, but you can also, um, I, I think the reason why I love getting food right uh, or enjoyable is because I think there's, I like meeting people and I like um, enjoying time with the people that I'm with on track. And so I tend to cook meals uh, for the group. So last time I did the Overland track uh, was uh, with my family, so my wife, two kids, um, my sister and her two adult kids. Um, so there's seven of us on track and I cooked for all of us each night. Um, and um, uh, so it just meant, you know, it was, a, it was a time where we all just sat down together, we enjoyed a meal together and, um, and were able to, you know, sit out on the helipad and um, uh, reflect on the day and uh, and just you know, there, there's just something about eating together that was really good and so we had things like um, I can't remember the first night we had uh, nachos um, set up on a really big plate um, and we had um, uh, some different curries and stuff like that and we uh, and I'll often do desserts so if you're looking for food ideas and want to do it yourself um, Bushwalking 101 MPA's um, fantastic site has a uh, planning a menu section. Go check it out. There's some really good ideas for breakfasts, uh, for lunches uh, and for dinners, um, many which are simple. Um, now, what you do see a lot of on the Overland track is everybody using freeze-dried meals, uh, packet, um, pre-made, um, pre-purchased things. They're about 15 bucks a meal. Um, so they're quite expensive. Um, um, but also what you see is by day three, like day one, everyone's saying, oh, these are fantastic and they're loving it. Day two, oh, yeah, these are pretty good. Day three, day four, they are spending a lot of time around others who are cooking their meals, um, looking at what other options there are. Because even though they're trying different flavours of their meal every night, they all kind of taste the same and they're not very exciting. Um, so, um, so think about meals and... Um, don't worry, you know, spend a bit of money and buy a, a, a dehydrator um, and you'll end up saving money because you're not spending as much on the freeze-dried meals and you can dry some really fantastic meals. Um, last time I was on track, um, as I said, uh, with my sister uh, and her family and my wife, it was uh, over Christmas. Um, and so we had Christmas Day at Peely and Hutt um, and we cooked up a feast and ate a lot and ate too much and... Um, but um, you know, had a, had a full on proper Christmas celebration um, and my wife's birthday on track as well. So 
I felt the pressure a bit, but it was, uh, but we had a lot of fun doing that as well. So time on track. Um, most people walk the overland in about six, five or six days, something like that. Um, uh, somewhere between five, six and seven days. It's kind of the most popular uh, way to walk it. Um, you see plenty of people on track whisk past you, past you doing it in two, three or four days. Um, now, if that's the only way you can do it um, because of how life is, um, then do it. You know, it, it, it's very enjoyable. Uh, you'd still see it. Um, my preference is the more time you can spend on track, the better. Uh, uh, five, six or seven days. These are just different itineraries to give you a sense of the pace um, and um, gives you, uh, you know, in terms of food weight, uh, you can do that. If you're doing a 10 day trip, like the one on the right hand side um, and adding to that walking the ferry, uh, walking the lake rather than catching the ferry, um, your pack, you, you really need to think about food um, because your, your pack weight will be quite heavy. Uh, to start off with otherwise uh, but but with good planning it's it, it's relatively easy to get your food weight down so that you can spend 10 um, or 11 days on track um, and you know those recipes are there for you to, to give you a hand but but spend the time um, uh, and uh, the more time you spend then the more time you have you know to have a, a chilled day if the weather turns in um, and the weather does turn in um, um, and it just gives you more options and more ways to enjoy it. You might meet up with some other people on track that you're really enjoying the company of, um, and you might walk with them for a few days. You might meet up with some people on track that you're really not enjoying the company of and might want to hold back and let them go. Um, so it just gives you more options. Um, planning, preparing, and fitness. Uh, these are kind of the questions I get the most about walking uh, the track. Uh, walking is important. <laughs> um, uh, I feel a bit bad getting you all excited about this because the, the overland track's fully booked for, pretty much fully booked for, for next year, for the next 12 months. Um, partly that's because of COVID, they've got uh, reduced numbers on track, um, but it, it's also becoming very popular and there is a booking system, although no fee in place um, for winter as well at the moment during the COVID times. Um, the booking's there because um, they had an experience where the track's carrying capacity was exceeded ridiculously. I think there was like 200 people uh, down at Waterfall Valley, half of which didn't have tents, and so they're trying to sleep in a hut. Uh, there's two huts down there, um, and, you know, that's a disaster. People sleep on floors and picnic tables and all sorts of stuff. Those who have tents are camping outside, and there's not enough room for all those tents. Uh, and it was just trashing the environment, let alone the experience for the people. So they put in a booking system and, uh, and it was a good call, um, but it does cost a couple hundred bucks to book a ticket for an adult. Um, and you need to be ready to book at 9 a.m. on the 1st of July when the website opens. Um, and this year, December, January, February, booked out in just shy of 10 minutes. Um, so you really, um, this is something that you need to plan ahead for. <laughs> uh, but, but, but if you want to do it during that summertime, which is really when you're going to get the best weather window, plan ahead and be ready to, to book uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and, and, and when you go to do that, have a few dates as your options. So go for your most popular date um, and um, work your way through your dates until you find the, the, you know, the best option you can. Um, once you book the track, uh, you need to obviously think about transport. I'll, I'll give you some more links in terms of what all the options are in terms of ferries and flights and all that sort of stuff and accommodation. There is accommodation right at the trackhead, um, uh, the Wardheim chalets. It sounds really fancy. It's not really fancy. Um, they're, they're very simple huts. And I think it's probably the cheapest accommodation in the area anyway. Um, but you, you pick up your tickets, you, your passes the day before, you catch the bus down and you stay at the Wardheim chalets. And then in the next morning, when you get up, you um, you get up, put your pack on um, and um, uh, you lock the keys in the chalet and off you go. Um, and you, you you start, you step out the chalet and basically onto the track uh, from there. So it's a really good option. Um, and some of them are quite large sleeping, I think about eight. Um, generally, they, they there's different, a few different cabins through there. Um, uh, sleeping between four and eight uh, and they have a shared bathroom in a separate building 
So um, really great option, really great option uh, in terms of accommodation. Uh, but you need to book it. So as soon as you book your ticket for the overland track, I'd suggest booking a couple of nights in at the chalets uh, the night before. Um, fitness, um, look, walking the overland track, the fitter you are, the more you're going to enjoy it. Um, we had a bit of a laugh on the last trip. Uh, we met a lovely lady um, um, on day three whose phrase had been, uh, it's just a walk, how hard can it be? Um, and um, she'd never put on an overnight pack. <laughs> until she started the overland track and she found out how hard it can be. Um, and the poor lady was in tears on, uh, when we met her on day three. Her pack didn't fit, she wasn't fit enough, all sorts of stuff. Anyway, we, we got her pack set up and um, she ended up having a fantastic time as her fitness build and as her skills developed over the time. Um, but get that done before you hit the track. Um, so get out, do some walks. Um, I'd strongly encourage you getting out and walking sections of the Great North Walk through Brow Valley National Park. Um, and I say that because um, I assume a lot of people are in Sydney that we're speaking to now, um, uh, because the hills are very familiar, the hills are very similar sort of steepness uh, to what you'll experience on the first day of the overland. Um, so get out there with day packs, build up your strength, get out there then with your overnight pack that you're planning on taking um, and do some walks through there. Um, and even if you're only getting a day, you know, getting out there for a few hours with your full pack on, um, uh, it, it all makes a difference. So, so do that. In terms of skill building, um, if you're walking in summer, you do need some bushwalking experience. Uh, the track's quite easy to navigate. Um, um, there's not a lot of particular, you know, there's a lot of people who hit this track without any bushwalking experience. Um, and if the weather's reasonable, you'll be fine. Um, but get some practice walking in wet weather. You know, put your, your raincoat on, put your pack on next time it rains and just go out and go for a walk because it is different walking in wet weather. Um, and, and, and get some practice walking in wet weather. How do you enjoy uh, walking in wet weather? Um, you know, making sure that you've got your raincoat adjusted and your hat so that you can look up and look around and all that sort of stuff. Um, because, you know, it can be a real joy walking in the rain um, if you've had the time to practice uh, and build up those skills. Uh, there's a bunch of other skills. Again, I'll send you off to some links on that. A lot of that stuff's on Bushwalking 101, of course. Uh, equipment. Um, so you need a sleeping bag uh, that's rated at least to minus five. Um, and... You'd probably get away with a zero during summer, but I'll, um, I'd strongly recommend a minus five bag. Um, uh, you just definitely need a sleeping mat or mattress of some kind. Um, I use an inflatable mattress because I um, sleep better on those. Um, you do need a, a three or a four season tent. Um, and, um, and then the rest is, you know, your stove and all the, all the rest of the normal stuff that you carry. Um, with your tent, um, it's probably one of your heaviest bits of gear. Um, so <clears throat> try to work it um, if you can to um, get a lighter tent. Um, so you see a lot of people on the track with a relatively cheap tent that wouldn't stand up to a snowstorm or, or, or to a harsh weather. Um, um, but they also weigh a lot. You know, some people I saw on track had a three, three and a half kilo two person tent. Um, when you, you can really easily do a, a two-person tent um, for, for a couple of kilos. And every kilo you get out of your pack, you, you will be very thankful for getting it out of your pack. Keep your pack as light as you possibly can. Uh, food, we've already spoken about, about that. Um, rail, rain, hail, snow, and more just on day one. Um, and then every other day after that. So just plan for um, uh, all the weather. Um, it does snow in summer um, and last trip we had weather like this blue skies the whole way the trip before some of the photos you might have seen earlier um, it was getting up to marion's lookout so day one before lunch um, it had um, rained i don't know how many millimeters but 20 probably it was just pouring um, the the track itself was uh, a river um, then it hailed uh, then it snowed um, and then we got to Marion's Lookout and then the sun came out and we had this fantastic view um, for about five minutes and then it started to pour again and we got up to Kitchen Hut um, where we cooked up some hot chocolates and popcorn uh, for the kids. 
um, warmed up and then got back out and, and the weather cooled again for a little while. So be prepared for it all. It, you hear the stories and they're, and they're true. Um, I'll leave this slide up for a little while, but here's um, the, the basic places to go to um, for more information. So the left-hand side, we've got the MPA, um, um, uh, Bushwalk 101 site. You can uh, use your smartphone. We're all used to um, QR codes now. Um, so scan them on your screen or um, uh, all the, the URLs are above uh, if you want to type those in. Um, but the Bushwalking 101 site is great for meals. It's great for equipment. Um, what sort of tents, sleeping bags, all that sort of stuff is there. Uh, the bottom uh, two sites are um, bushwalk.com, uh, which is uh, a new version of Wild Walks um, that's uh, recently released, um, which sort of goes out of New South Wales. And, um, and on there, we've got um, all the track notes, the maps and stuff uh, for the Overland Track. You can download those for free. Um, and in there are also all the articles, um, what to pack, gear lists, um, how to plan, talks about fitness, it talks about you know, what to put in your first aid kit, all that sort of stuff as well. And then the right-hand side, of course, is the Parks Tassie uh, website um, where you can um, look at booking um, and any other alerts and information um, that you have there. But now it's time for questions, I think. That's over to you, Gary. While we're waiting for Gary, um, uh, jump in that chat section, or maybe I should jump in that chat section. Maybe you're waiting on me. Um, uh, and and uh, feel free to ask any questions, make any comments if you think I got anything wrong. Um, Brian Everyhan's making a rude comment about uh, what's that, a blue sky, uh, that's very true. I've been very spoiled, I must say, uh, with weather on the overland. Uh, I did a winter trip and um, we had blue skies and um, uh, sunny days for the last five days. The first two days, we didn't see views from Marion's or, you know, we were probably five metres, maybe 10 metres from Kitchen Hut before we could see it. Um, so, um, Blue weather, blue skies are reasonably common, but take don't take them for granted. <laughs> you there, Gary? Right. Yep. Matt, you're all lucky because I can't enable video, so I'll just talk. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. I'm, I'm actually kicking myself that I didn't start counting how many times you were going to mention hot chocolate at the start because <laughs> there's clearly a bit of a pattern uh, developed there. But, um, look, you set an extraordinary... Um, standards so it's a fantastic way to launch things and um as someone who lived for a couple of years down in tassie i can can just um reiterate your comments about expect all those weathers in the first day um be prepared for everything the place has to throw at you um look thanks everyone we've got uh, a number of questions have come through on the chat line um the first which i'm assuming was somewhat facetious from Brian Everingham was um, questioning whether there was such a thing as blue skies in Tasmania. But we'll, <laughs> we'll move past that to the question of um, how one directional is the walk? What's, what are the rules around which way you go? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, during what they call the booking season, so it's the warmer months um, uh, from, I think it's October through to uh, beginning of April, uh, you have to walk from uh, in, in the single direction from um, uh, from Cradle to Lake St. Clair. Um, during the colder months, during winter, you can walk in either direction. Uh, during the booking season, you have to have a permit um, to uh, to do the walk. Um, but And that permit um, means that you can start on the day that your permit states. Once you start the walk, you can walk at any pace you want. Um, so um, you're walking one way, so you can't go back and forth up and down the track. You have to keep going forward. Um, but if you want to spend two or three or four days at a particular campsite and then go off and do all the side trips, that's 100% fine and, um, and, and definitely not even discouraged. You know, they're, they're very comfortable with you spending as much time as you want on a track. And I, again, I'd recommend it. Um, the first section of the walk, um, you can walk into Waterfall Valley as a day trip. Um, 
Uh, you can walk from the south up to Windy Ridge, so that Burke Nichols hut, and up to Pine Valley anytime without a permit. Um, and you can actually walk into Pelion Hut itself and do some of those central walks uh, if you come up the Arm River, Arm River, uh, which is a nice walk in itself. And it's a, it, it's about I don't know five hours from the road to 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 that as well. So there's a few options, but generally speaking, um, you, you're heading from the north to the south. Thanks, Matt. And you've nicely covered off on Gillian's question on exactly that issue of the. Uh, extent to which you can access things just as a, a day walk um, or segments of day walks. Um, okay, we had a question from Kay, if you could just sort of remind us of that resource you talked about for meal planning. And I, I must say, I'm very curious about your dehydrators as well. So <laughs> perhaps if you could sort of give us a bit more on that issue. Yeah, great. Um, let me um, share my screen again. Um, and um so where are we bushwalking uh 101 um so uh it, bushwalking 101 is the key thing to remember um and then uh i think it's under uh, uh, uh yeah ge gear for some reason it should be a skill but anyway meals and cooking um and that brings you through to to a page like this um uh yeah stock photography you know you've got to be carried away. Uh, and from here, we've got lots of information about meals, uh, about uh, planning a menu. We've got all the example menus, um, um, pros and cons of different ways of doing it, and also how to cook it. Um, and the ridiculous amount of detail in here. We touch on uh, dehydrating. Um, for dehydrating, I, I literally just, uh, the cheapest dehydrator I could find on eBay, square one. I, I avoid the round ones. The round ones are fine, um, but because I, do a lot of it. I tend to prefer the square ones. Um, you can get a lot more food in there and they dry more evenly if you're getting into it. Maybe, you know, if there's a lot of interest in um, dehydrating, put a comment in the in the chat section. We might be able to do a different, another webinar on, on food dehydration. But a couple of things um, about dehydrating food is think about, um, I actually pre-cook and dehydrate um, my rice. Uh, and my pasta. Um, and so uh, once I'm out on track, I just have to boil water and add it. Um, not, I don't actually have to cook the rice. So uh, it saves you a lot of weight in fuel. It saves you a lot of time stuffing around in camp. Um, so when I get into camp, once we're ready for dinner, I'll rehydrate the meat for the curry. Um, and then I will um, wrap that up in a jumper. I, I rehydrate in a, in a um, in a freezer bag, in a plastic bag, uh, wrap it up and jump it to keep it warm, leave that for 10 or 15 minutes. And then uh, whilst that's um, rehydrating, I uh, do the same thing with the rice in another bag, stick it in there. You can reuse the bags as many times as you want. Um, and then, um, and serve it up from there. They take about 10 or 15 minutes to, to rehydrate. Um, and um, so some of the meals we had, um, we had, uh, nachos day one I, I love that as a as a starter meal uh, we literally open up the packet of uh, chips um, and use that as a platter spread the platter out we have the meat to put on top I carry some cheese in frozen sprinkle that over the top uh, we did sushi um, for a lot of lunches so sushi we uh, dehydrate the rice um, and um, and then again it's just that simple process of rehydrating it with some sugar some powdered vinegar um, adding in the other flavors rolling up cutting it up uh, and that's the lunch for sunny days um, that was more of a bribery to get my daughter out and enjoy the walk because she loves sushi um, curries are very popular um, soups are really good you can do a lot of stuff just straight from colesworth type shoppings um, with soups and um, uh, um, sort of noodle based soups and all that sort of stuff as well so all that bushwalk.com there's lots of stuff uh, sorry uh, bushwalking 101 um, for all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And Matt, can I presume that we can also go to Bushwalking 101 for advice on cooking equipment? We've got a question in here about how many billies you carry. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so part of, uh, so I always try to carry just one. Um, so I just mentioned there that for large groups, I tend to rehydrate everything in a plastic bag. I know everyone's freaking out going, oh, that's too much plastic. And, and that's a fair concern, um, but I'm doing it in those freezer bags, which are incredibly light. It's a very small amount of plastic compared to what most people do, which is these pre-bought big heavy plastic bags. Um, and you can reuse them. 
you just rinse them to wash them. Um, and it means that you can rehydrate your food you're using your billy just to boil water. Um, you put your food to rehydrate in your bag, you add the water, and then you tie it um, with a slip knot, and you wrap that up in your jumper as a cozy, and that keeps it warm, just make sure nobody sits on it. Um, and, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then whilst that's rehydrating, your, your pot's free uh, to cook some more hot chocolates or popcorn. Um, so that, that's the way I tend to do it. Um, and, and you can cook for large groups. I cooked up to, uh, what was the last trip we did in the room? There was, I think it was 17 people um, that I did a meal for. And, um, and that's how we did it, um, just in plus bags. So I had a one litre um, jet boil um, that I used. Matt, we've got a couple of people commenting on natural hazards, in particular snakes, and just wondering if you might reflect on the virtues of gators. Yeah, look, it's it's. I'm I'm a mixed use. Look, uh, there, there definitely are snakes in Tassie, um, and and you definitely don't want to be bit by them. Um, uh, gators uh, are quite popular. Um, as to the value that they add in terms of snake protection, there, there's not a lot of research, unfortunately, into that space. So I can't tell you that gators, there are particular gators that you can get that are heavy duty designed to stop snake fangs. Um, but most gators you buy off the shop probably wouldn't stop a snake fang. And my concern is that if a snake does bite, um, that they can't then get out. They might get stuck in a gator and you keep scratching you and then you're going to make some more. There's no research, so I don't know the answer to, to that. What should be a simple question, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but the incidence of snake bites is tiny uh, on the overland track uh, or anywhere, really. Um, so walk in a group and send the person that you don't particularly like first. Um, and um, But in all seriousness, as you're walking, you're making a bit of noise. Uh, the snakes uh, will clear out as you go. Um, do keep an eye around campsites. They do like to sun on things like tent platforms uh, and on the tracks uh, because they are good for sunning. Um, and be particularly mindful if the weather's gone from warm to cold very quickly um, because snakes get stuck um, if, they, if it gets cold too quickly um, and they might not be able to move out as quickly as they want. Um, but give them a wide berth and, and, and fine. Um, but do carry uh, in the first aid kit or a snake bandage. The first aid for snake bites is, um, is incredibly effective. Okay, and Matt, a, two questions to finish up on. One with regards uh, accessibility, and the question is what level of disabled access is there, particularly uh, for folk with wheelchairs? And the other one is a, a bit of a specific question, but if uh, a recommendation for a good size pack and a weight to aim for, for a smaller framed person. Right, good questions. Uh, disability access, unfortunately, um, it, it's extraordinarily limited. If, if, you're some, if you're a wheelchair user and wanting to do the overland track, um, uh, it would be possible using something like a, uh, one of these single wheel, um, um, uh, they're recording now. Uh, trail riders um, with uh, with a couple of sherpas to to run you through. It would be a lot of work, um, and you'd have to think about particularly the route on the first day. Um, um, so, if that's something that you're keen to do, I would suggest tackling the southern end uh, first, um, which is the flatter end. Uh, practice dealing with things like swing bridges first. Um, it, it's not a great setup for it, unfortunately. So. Um, um, but if you are in a wheelchair, uh, there, there's quite good access around uh, the start of the walk around uh, Dove Lake um, and also at the southern end, there's, there's some, some reasonably good walks that you can do along um, relatively rough terrain. But if you've got a, a free wheel, um, you'd be able to negotiate and reasonably well. All the huts have steps uh, into the entrance and all that sort of stuff. So it's really not well set up um, uh, in terms of inclusiveness for people in wheelchairs. Um, but, but for other people with arthritis and uh, back pain and that sort of stuff, uh, people do use uh, walking sticks uh, as a way to help uh, manage that. Um, and um, some people do carry uh, folding uh, lightweight aluminium chairs uh, to sit on as well um, if their knees are particularly dodgy to protect those uh, during the day. In terms of a pack, um, packs are, are 
there's two types of packs uh, in my view, um, and it, my bias is going to come out here. Um, but but there's your, your pretty standard um, sort of canvas pack with, with a reasonable harness, um, and, and they're all very similar um, in in how they work. So for the, for your common style pack, it's a matter of going into a into a cabin store and just trying on until one that you find one that fits your frame. Uh, well, um, and don't be afraid to spend a bit of time looking around. In terms of favourite type of pack, for me personally, I'm a big fan of the Arn pack. Um, I've not no sponsorship or anything like that. Um, Double A R N. It's a New Zealand company, um, and they have the world's weirdest looking backpack. Um, let me see if I've got one in my room here. I've got a lot of junk here. I do. So I don't know. Can you see my pack? So it's that's your, your your pack that's fairly normal, but it's got these balance pockets at the front of your pack, and they um, so at the front of your pack you've got two two sort of ten liter packs that sit on your harness, and you put all your heavy stuff in there like water. Um, your stoves and your, uh, and your food, and it's amazing how much lighter your pack feels because you're not being pulled back. Um, because you've got half your weight in the front, half your weight in your pack, in your back, you're much more centered. And I reckon your pack feels 30% lighter uh, with an arm pack. Um, they are fiddly. <laughs> so you've got a few extra straps. The harness is hung differently. Um, so you, your shoulders are much more free to move. Um, uh, there's basically no weight on your shoulders. Everything goes straight to your, onto your hips. Um, so if you're somebody who struggles, particularly um, more petite people, um, I would really strongly encourage you looking at an arm pack. Uh, in terms of a target weight, um, I think 15 kilos is a really um, reasonable weight to aim for for doing the overland track over about a week. Um, I, I think you can do that fairly low budget. Um, um, you know, things like uh, you can get two kilo tents quite cheaply um, these days online. Um, Single little sleeping bags, you can get them quite light. So. So I think 15 kilos, half of that is probably food to kick off with. Um, yeah, so hopefully that's helpful. Thanks, Matt. Look, that's been fantastic. And as I say, it's um, you, you've set an extraordinary standard for those who to come to follow. Could I just ask everyone to help me in the world's least spontaneous round of applause? Just go down to reactions and you'll see there's a little um, pair of clapping hands over on uh, one side there. Um, Thank you. Uh, nice. Look, just a couple of pieces to finish up to let you know that we are planning to do this as a weekly exercise. Um, next week, we're going to have Shani Connell talking about uh, wildlife caring. And a week after that, I'm going to do the ex absolute opposite of Matt. And rather than talk about a, a grand adventure, actually sort of focus in on um, unpacking your very, very local patch. Um, this is something we'd like to be able to sustain, but that's really going to be a matter of the quality of the, um, the talks we can produce. So could I invite people to contact us at activities at mpansw.org.au with two things. Firstly, suggestions for topics you'd like to see covered, whether that's um, exploring a particular park or whether it's a, um, bushwalking techniques, or it could be on any other topic to do with MPA business in conservation and advocacy. Um, but more than anything else, what I want to see is people actually volunteering to be our next speakers. So um, if everyone could just put on your thinking cap, have a little consideration of what you would like to hear and what you might like to share with your fellow MPA members and supporters, and just go down to activities at MPA nsw.org.au and let us know what you'd like to see coming up in this series. Um, thanks once again. I hope that you've enjoyed it and um, it's a pleasure to be able to spend some time with our members. Thanks all. Bye. Bye all.